Good morning, Anchor Point. Good morning. That sounded pretty good. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our outdoor service at Anchor Point Bible Church. I'm Pastor Rob. I'm looking out. I see some friends and visitors with us today, as well as many, many of our regulars. Uh, this is something that we've been looking forward to for a long time, tying in with our car show and fun for the entire family. Through the day, you're going to be hearing loud muffler noises of people pulling into the parking lot. People said. Amen. Well, good morning. Glad you're here. Uh, we are going to have a service. We're going to worship God in spirit and in truth this morning. Um, and then after we worship God and we sing about His grace and sing about how great He is, we're going to have a car show, right? And yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excited about that. And I don't know how much you know about cars, but I'm going to give you a short, short lesson. I'll keep it short, I promise. So the types of cars that you'll be seeing here is first type you're going to see are called... <laughs> Just kidding. You're going to see the re restored cars, the restoration cars, right? You're going to see those, but you're also going to see numbers matching cars, right? And those are the cars that come here just like they were from the factory. The same engine, the same uh, transmission, the same everything. All the serial numbers, everything still matches, right? Am I right? That's correct, right? So everything still matches. And then, like I said, then you're going to have the restoration cars. And then you're going to have what they call the resto mod cars, right? And those are the old cars that have been restored, but with today's modern technology, right? If it didn't have air conditioning, now it does. If it didn't have assisted brakes, now you do, so your left leg doesn't have to get, or right leg doesn't have to get really strong, right? <laughs> so, but those are basically your three types of cars that you're going to see. You'll see different ones, but the one I want to talk about right now is about the restoration ones. And, um, on the restoration, a lot of times they'll do the frame off restoration, the body off the frame restoration. And the reason why they do that is because a lot of times when the body's still on the car, the frame, a lot of defects in the frame are hidden, right? It can be cracked, it can be have holes in it, it can be bent from an accident that happened 30 years ago, right? Um, and then in Michigan, I've learned you got to deal with this a lot, rust, right? The frame can be rusted out. And I say all that to say this, is that when the frame is strong, when the frame is true, when the frame is repaired, and the frame is straight, you can build on that frame. And everything you build on that frame now is straight and true and go from there, right? And Jesus, he's our cornerstone, right? He's, he's our frame that we can build on, right? And there's no cracks, and there's no holes, and he's not bent anywhere, and we can build on him. And like the first song we're gonna sing is called Cornerstone, right? And he's our cornerstone, and we can build on him. And everything that we build on him is straight, and it's true. And you can put your hope and your faith in that. Let's sing. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood.
Christ alone. Christ alone. Usually I just have my headset on, so I'm used to waving my arms a little bit more. But I don't have a clicker for my PowerPoint and uh, that type of presentation, so we'll see if uh, this works out okay. So this summer we've been looking at um, some of the great heroes of faith in the Bible. And today we're going to look at one of the best known, one of the best loved characters in the entire scriptures. And that is Daniel. And of course, once again, I find myself struggling how to introduce him and even what story to tell about Daniel because there's so many found in the Bible. You know that there's a book in the Old Testament that actually bears his name, Daniel, and it's been said that Daniel is to the Old Testament what Revelation is to the New Testament. Daniel moves from a, a great crisis in Judah's history, goes forward to the coming of the Messiah, and then fast forwards into the future and the terrifying time of judgment that is coming upon the world by the Lord Almighty. It's such a practical book. I, I hope someday to actually do a, a series on the man and his message. But where do we begin? Well, should I give you a, maybe a historical overview of the times in which he lived? Political upheaval, climate crises with natural disasters of fire and wars and all kinds of persecution of God's people. It's, it, it's like headlines ripped out of today's society. Should I tell you of the story of Daniel's three friends who stood up? When everybody bowed down to the government mandate and faced the ultimate cancel culture when they were thrown into a burning fire. And when they came out, not a hair on their head was even singed, nor did they smell at all even like smoke. Should I tell you about Daniel calling out the president, I mean the king, about his anti-God antics and then how he interpreted the writing on the wall? as God's judgment for Belshazzar's corrupt administration. How about Daniel's visions that held the terrifying future that's going to come as the Lord is going to judge the sin and corruption of the world system whose leaders have turned their backs upon God. Or how those visions speak to this very day when he tells us of the, the times of the Gentiles. And all of us here, if we're not of Jewish blood, that we can trace our lineage back to Abraham, that's all of us. That's who the Gentiles are. And helps us see that God is still in control of human affairs, no matter how bad things get. We've actually seen some situations like this before in our People of Faith, Heroes of Faith series. Um, each of the ones that we have looked at have actually wondered if it could get any worse. But then we find God stepping in and delivering them each and every one. So Daniel, uh, he's not, we've been kind of looking at Hebrews chapter 11 and that's known as the Great Hall of Faith. And in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, while we don't find Daniel's name, we find something that the writer says after going through a whole list of people. He says, what more then shall I say? For time fails me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel, and the prophets. These who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Wait, wait, did you catch that in the middle? 
stopped the mouths of lions. That has to be a reference to Daniel of one of the most familiar Bible stories to anybody who's grown up with the stories of the Bible, Daniel in the lion's den. So can't you almost just see those flannel graphs from Sunday school? Since I don't have PowerPoint today, I thought I would uh, give you a couple of visuals here and go old school. So you've got the king and you've got the, uh, the satraps, you've got Daniel praying, of course you've got the lions, the angel, all that stuff. So if that helps you when I'm telling this story, uh, but it certainly brings back a lot of memories for me and maybe for some of you as well. So, okay, here's a little, here's a little historical context that's important for us. King Nebuchadnezzar and his son Belshazzar uh, of the Babylonian Empire have been conquered. Nobody ever thought that could happen. They were like the top of the line. And so we had passed, if you notice on the back of your bulletins, on the sermon notes, you, we had passed from the golden head of the Babylonians to the silver chest and arms of another empire known as the Medo-Persians. Now, there's a new ruler from this empire, and the big question is, how is this ruler going to rule? Well, before we dive into Daniel chapter 6, you can turn there as well if you'd like, I want to share a couple of things that, that relate to the historical setting that I've just mentioned. You see, all through human history, nations are born, they live and flourish, and they die. They rise and fall with really great regularity. And if you're any kind of student of history, and I think we all should be, you heard of the great civilizations of the Hittites, of the Assyrians, of the, the Babylonians, where we find David actually first coming on the scene, taken in captivity from his beloved Jerusalem and Israel. But they didn't last, see? The Babylonians were conquered by the Medes and the Persians who then fell to the Greeks under Napoleon, who were then defeated by the well-known power of the military of the Romans. But all of them came, and all of them went. How about here in our Western Hemisphere? There is little, if any, archaeological evidence of the great civilizations of the Incas and the Mayans and the Aztecs flourished. And now not a trace of them left. We've seen it in modern times. We could talk about England and France, Italy, Germany, Russia, Japan. Every one of them had designs to conquer the world. China seems to be intent on that as well. Now, here, here's where I have to pull back a little bit because I could, I could say a lot about why those nations have fallen from their heights and what happened to them and why. But the point I'm making is that all nations rise and all nations fall. They come and they go. The Bible tells us in Acts 17 that the times of the nations are bounded. They're, the boundaries are given to them by the sovereignty of God. And what happens to all nations is all in the predetermined plan of God for human history. Now what's especially thrilling, I believe, is that the coming and going of nations has very little to do with the ongoing of the people of God. So how does this fit in with Daniel in the lion's den? Well, as I mentioned in Daniel 6, there's a, there's a new king in charge, a new empire on the scene. And as you see, in, as I mentioned in your sermon notes, if you looked at those, that image from one of Daniel's earlier visions, we come now to the Medo-Persian Empire, the chest, the arms of silver. Not quite as spectacular as the head of gold, but very strong nonetheless. But guess who's still on the scene in this new administration? Daniel, right there, God's man in the middle of this new rule. And that got me thinking a little bit too. <clears throat> 
I think we have to be very careful not to equalize America with the church, the body of Christ. America is America. It's the greatest country in the history of the world as far as I'm concerned. But it is not the church. It is not the body of Christ that is made up of both Jew and Gentile who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation. You see, the plan of God is not dependent on any world power, certainly not the United States of America, because no nation other than Israel, I should say, is really significant when set against the backdrop of eternity and God's plan. Nations come and nations go, but God's work goes on. In fact, Daniel himself said back in chapter 4 and verse 17 that all the political stuff that happens with the nations, it happens, get this, so that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. It reminds me of the great prophet Isaiah who said in Isaiah 40, 15, Behold, the nations are like a drop in the bucket and are counted as the dust on the scales. In other words, God rules in history. Nations come, nations go. Perhaps our own is on the other side of this if we do not turn back to the Lord. But God's redemptive plan is unfolded through his people going on according to his schedule. The people of God go through the rise and fall of nations. We, we transcend. I think there's great hope there for us. And we find, we find Daniel right in the middle of where God wants him to be in the course of human history, which now brings us to the, the rest of the story, okay? If you haven't already turned or scrolled on your device to Daniel chapter 6, he's now in the midst of the Medo-Persian Empire. And we find the new king running things a little differently than before. Unlike the Babylonian monarchs, uh, they ruled with absolute force. Uh, the Medo-Persians uh, like to delegate responsibilities a little bit more. And we see in verses 1 and 2, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials, of whom David was one, Daniel was one, to whom the satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Now, a couple things here quickly. Uh, Darius, we're told here in verse 1, is in charge. Now, Darius is actually more of an official title rather than a specific person. In fact, archaeologists have found at least five references to Darius for five different Persian kings. So just the word Darius doesn't mean that is his particular name here. They're all called Darius. So if we tie something in here, if you go to the end of the chapter, verse 28, you see that Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius, and then there's that word and, the reign of Cyrus the Persian, we could see this as more of an equal sign. He, re he prospered during the reign of Darius, in other words, the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So it's, it's my thought that this indeed could be Cyrus whom Daniel is serving under. And the next thing I want to point out is this idea, have any of you ever heard the word satrap? Yeah, unless you've read it in the Bible, right? Satrap. This is an old Persian word that means a, ru a provincial ruler or a protector of the kingdom. And we see there's 120 of these satraps or governors, perhaps we could say. And so the king, Cyrus, now appoints three to be over all of those governors. And it's... You know, he can't keep track of everybody, so he is going to appoint these three to oversee them. Now, that brings us then to Daniel again, and what I'm going to say are some marks of distinction 
for this great hero of faith. What I want to do here, well, let's look at verse 3. He says, that, Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set over him the whole kingdom. So, as we look at the story of Daniel and the lion's den in chapter 6, I want to look at the reasons that God used him in such a, a powerful, even miraculous way. And if you want to write some things down in the back of your sermon uh, or the outline in the bulletin, you can do that. The first thing, if you want to write it down, is that he had an excellent spirit. Excuse me, an excellent attitude, an excellent attitude. Verse 3 says it was an excellent spirit in him. So I, I, when he talks about attitude, don't you just love to be around people who have this kind of attitude? I mean, it's healthy, it's, it's joyful, it just lifts others up, and it's fun to be around somebody that has an attitude like this. It's an old saying, but it said that attitude will define your altitude. In other words, where you go in life has a lot to do about your attitude. There's another quote that I've shared in the past, and it means a lot to me. I've had it printed out and read and reread it many, many times. It's from Chuck Swindoll, and this is what he says. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than whatever people think, say, or do. He goes on. It is more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, or a home. The remarkable thing is that we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act a certain way we cannot change the inevitable. Look at this. The only thing we can do is play the one string we have, and that is our, what? Attitude, right? And finally, he ends with this statement. I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you, he says. We are in charge of our attitudes. Isn't that great? Great quote. So it was with Daniel. Now, there's a lot that Daniel couldn't control. But one thing that he could control was how he reacted to the things around him. And his attitude, we're told here, was excellent. So the next mark of distinction, number two, for our hero of faith, was his untarnished integrity. His untarnished integrity. Look at verse 4. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find the ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Oh, wow. So these other leaders grow jealous when they find out that the king is going to appoint him as the number one guy. That's all it is, jealousy. And so they decide to take him down. They set up a, a covert investigation. They leave no proverbial rock unturned to try to dig up some dirt or find a skeleton in his closet. They try. And they tried, and they tried, and you know what? They came up with nothing, nada, zilch, zippo. They couldn't find anything by which to accuse him. Why is that? Because Daniel lived his entire life with untarnished integrity. That's number two, untarnished integrity. That's a great word, isn't it? Integrity it comes from the, the Latin word integritas. Uh, it means wholeness or completeness. Uh, we know the word may be more familiar, integer, a whole number. There wasn't anything missing in Daniel's character by which they could find fault in him. He was a man of wholeness, a man of integrity. Now, I'm quick to say he was not a perfect man. 
He was not a sinless man. There's only one in all of human history that is and was, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. See, but Daniel stood out because he was blameless. Now, for you and I, as believers today, God declares us to be integers, whole, complete, perfect, just, righteous, Nothing to be set to our account because we now are in Christ, set apart, pure, and holy. That's our position. And it's because of that position, of that standing before God, that we now, as Christians, have a desire to serve God and to be like Christ in what we do and what we say. Now when, not if, but when we fall short of those ideals of who we really are in him we can confess our sin we can repent and allow the holy spirit to to change our hearts to bring us back to our heavenly father and to be transformed in our minds to serve him more completely you know jesus said to the woman who had been caught in the act of adultery sin sexual sin when nobody else could point their finger at her because of their own sin he didn't say, okay, you're free to go. He said to her, now go and sin no more. You see, that is the pinnacle of the Christian life. In Christ, who we are, living out his life within us. So Daniel has this untarnished integrity. The only thing that they're ever going to get him on is that he is totally committed to God. What a, what a commendation, right? Some of you may remember the old chorus of uh, that Sunday school song, Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Verse 4 tells us he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. All right, let's move it along here. And we're coming to the next mark of distinction, but I want to set this up. So th there's nothing that they can charge Daniel with. So what do they do? They say, well, we're going to flip the script, and they said, let's attack the one thing we know that he does and who he is, his faith. That's all they have. So they come up with this plan to deceive the king, and they go to the king, and they flatter him, and they tell him how wonderful he is and how mighty he is, and, and they say, you know what, you're so great, O oh king, that, that you should, you're, you're a god to us. In fact, we should make everybody say that you're a god for the next 30 days. Nobody can pray to any other gods. Nobody can make any appeal to any other gods that they believe in except to you, O oh great king. Now, Cyrus was kind of flattered by this. And he said, you know, well, thank you very much. Uh, that's a really great idea. Well, they didn't stop there. They said, you know, this is so important. You're so great that if, if you were going to make you God for 30 days, now that's the first problem right there, okay? If you're only a God for 30 days, you got a big problem, okay? Now, this shouldn't surprise us. I mean, ancient civilizations have always said their rulers are deities. The Egyptians said that the pharaohs were gods, right? The Romans said that the Caesars were gods. We see in Acts chapter 12, the Herods said that they were gods. Um, Paul reminds us in Romans 1 that left to themselves, left to ourselves, we will make gods in our own image. And so that's what is happening here with, um, with, uh, king, with the king. So all these political, these religious satraps, these rulers tell the king that they all agree. Well, that's a lie right there. Because they didn't all agree. There was one who would not have agreed with them, and that, of course, was Daniel. That you should make a rule. Uh, you should, by executive order, say that no one can pray to any other god but you. And to really, to really make it stick, if anyone is caught not obeying your godness, your deity, they should be put to death. In fact, we should make this really, really scary and say, if anyone doesn't pray to you as God, if they don't recognize you and your greatness and your godness, then they should be thrown into the lion's den and ripped apart. 
Well, the king's ego was stroked and he was persuaded. And, but what do you do? And so they pulled out a little uh, scroll at the time, I'm sure. And they said, oh, by the way, can, we've already got it written up. All, all it needs is just your signature to make it true. And if you put your signature on this, it says in verse 8 that the law of the Medes and Persians cannot be revoked. Like, it's a done deal. There's nothing to change this. Okay, this is where we find number three, Daniel's fearless devotion. His fearless devotion as the next mark of distinction. Look at verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber toward Jerusalem open. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. And then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. So under the threat of death from a man who claimed to be a God, Daniel continues to do what he always did and didn't hide what he always did and praise where he always did so that anyone could see what he always did, and that was pray to the one true God, Jehovah Jireh. There's a couple things about Daniel's prayer life here that just jumped out at me, and I, I'm going to call them Daniel's prayer part pointers if you want to write these down here. First of all, we see his place, his place. There's a regular set place where he meets with God. And I don't know if you have a place like that, uh, mine tends to be in my lazy boy chair in the morning with my Bible and my devotional right there. First thing in the morning, that's, that's my spot. I would say my kids have seen a spot in our house early in the morning where that's been where I've been. And of course, the New Testament commands us to uh, pray without ceasing, right? Anytime, anywhere. Uh, you can be in your car with your hands on your wheel, hopefully your eyes still open, and say a prayer. You can be walking into a uh, business meeting or a doctor's appointment and throw up one of those quick little arrow prayers, you know. Uh, prayer without ceasing, that's important. But Daniel also has this place where he goes to. It's a prayer room, a room upstairs in his house where he did business with God, business with God. So it was a place he did not allow his iPad to be. There was no internet. There was no TV upstairs. There was nothing that was to distract him from that place where he would meet with God and share his heart with God. Now, maybe you're wondering, why was he facing Jerusalem? Well, certainly Daniel, that was where the longing of his heart was. He was stolen away. He was captured from his beloved city, the city of God where the temple stood. So that's where his heart is and where he wants to be back to. And so it would make sense that he would be there facing Jerusalem. Second thing, we see his persistence. His persistence. Three times a day. Why three times a day? Not, why not two or four or five? Uh, well, it may come from David's example in Psalm 55 where it says, Morning, noon, and night. He calls to God, casting your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. The point is, regular, even scheduled prayer time is a healthy, good thing to have in the Christian life, to be persistent. The third thing I'll say is his posture. We see here that he got down on his knees, right? Now, I'm sure at this point in his life, He's, uh, his knees were feeling the wear and tear of um, the past, but that's what he did. And guess what? There's very few of you here that have anything on Daniel getting down on his knees, so you can't complain about it. He's pushing 90 years old at this point in his life, and he gets down on his knees. You see, I, I think posture does matter because it aligns our hearts. And the Bible speaks of many different postures for prayer, right? Uh, you've got down on your knees here. You've got standing up. The Apostle Paul talks about raising up holy hands or eyes up toward heaven. You've got face first on the ground, prostrate before God Almighty. And by the way, the most popular one of all, 
that's not in the Bible is, let's bow our heads, fold our hands, and close our eyes. Now, I'm sure that it came from a Sunday school teacher with a bunch of seven or eight-year-old kids that uh, were just out of control. And he had to teach them to be quiet when they prayed. It's a good thing. It just isn't in the Bible with those three particular things to say. Some of you are laughing because you were those kids with those teachers, I know. And B probably had a terrible time with some of you in the Berean church, right? But we find Daniel on his knees. Now, I know for me, that's a position for the, for the really big stuff. When my heart is so heavy about something, it was my kids growing up, now it's my grandkids or different situations where I just hit my knees and cry out to God for him to do the work that he needs to do. There's something powerful about that position. Don't discount it when it comes to your prayers. Try it out just once in a while. And you'll find a sweet communion with God because of the humbling and the subservient attitude that it brings with it. So Daniel's prayer part, uh, pointers help us in our prayer life. We have his place, his persistence, and his posture. So, okay, so I'm looking at time here. Now we come to the actual story of Daniel and the den of lions after the king decrees this law against praying to any other god. And we just talked about those three marks of Daniel's distinctions. Number three was the fearless devotion as he continued to pray. And of course, they catch him in the act. Look at verse 14. Um, he says, uh, then the king, let's see, yeah, when, then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Now, you know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. We don't know. We don't know what the king did. Maybe he tried to find a, a loophole in the law. Uh, perhaps he tried to find somewhere in the past in another law of the Medes and Persians that, that allowed him to undo this thing. But technically, there was no way out. And you know what I love about this? This is our, this is our last mark. And this is about Daniel's bold faith. His bold faith. He is cast into the den of lions. Now, what's a den? Well, it's usually a hole in the ground or perhaps even a cave in the side of a hill that would have at least two openings. There would be a door through which you could go into and throw meat and whatever to these animals. But there was also perhaps something up above that would have a hole looking down inside with a big grate over it that people, I hate to say it, but would kind of be able to do a little spectator sport in watching what was happening down inside. Well, um, these, by the way, uh, it says a stone, verse 17, was brought and laid on the mouth of the den and sealed. So, look, folks, these are real lions, all right? They're the real deal. Um, they are the king of the jungle, the king of beasts, and these lions, history records, would be intentionally, purposefully starved in order for them to be the executioners that people wanted them to be. I don't know how many that there were in there, but there wasn't just a couple. You know, the flannel graph only has a few here. There had to be perhaps a whole bunch of them because when you get to the end of the story here and that plot is uncovered, there's a whole lot of leaders and yes, even their families that are thrown in to this den and they are getting mauled before they even hit the ground. And so that takes a whole lot of lions tearing and ripping and gnashing at them before they even land. We're talking a whole lot of vicious, starving lions. Daniel is thrown in with them as King Cyrus cries out in verse 16, may your God, this pagan God, this pagan God cries out in verse 16, may your God whom you serve continually deliver you. And of course, he can't sleep all night 
And when morning comes, he runs to the place, and we see in verse 20, As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, in other words, he yelled out to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? And here's where we find the incredible answer from the depths of this pit that Daniel has been cast into for his excellent attitude, his untarnished integrity, his fearless devotion, and his answer back to the king, we find Daniel's bold faith. Verse 21, Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. Somebody else appropriated that, by the way. England, long live the king. O king, long live you. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him and also before you. O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. There is the banner over Daniel's life because he trusted in his God. That's why Daniel is a hero for us today. No matter what you're up against, friend, when things seem to be as bad as they could get, to have that same bold faith as Daniel and say, you know, I don't know what the end result is going to be here, but I trust in my God. He will take care of me. In fact, there's another great scene with Daniel's three friends that tie into this mindset back in chapter 3 when they are facing a situation of sure death, and they say in verse 15, as, as they're told, who's going to deliver you? What God will deliver you out of my hands, Nebuchadnezzar says. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery burning furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But listen to this. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. You know, Hebrews 11.34, I mentioned, says Daniel's faith in God stopped the mouths of lions. This bold, courageous faith. But you want to know something? It doesn't always happen like this. It's a great story that we remember, of course. But how about Isaiah? Isaiah trusted God, yet he ended up sawn in half. Peter ended up crucified upside down. How about Paul, who served God and loved God so completely, and yet he had to lay his head on a chopping block as that axe flashed in the sun and severed his head from his body. It doesn't always work out to be delivered from man. And the fact is, we have an adversary. We're told the devil prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. <laughs> History tells the story of many, many martyrs that have loved God and yet paid the ultimate price for being faithful to Him. Hebrews 11 tells us that this world is not worthy of them, but they were all commended for their faith. The issue is, as I'm winding it down here, is that we accept God's will for whatever it is that's going on in our life. If it is to live, it is to live for His glory. If it is to die, it is to die and then live in His glory. What do you think would have been better for Daniel 
standing there calling up to the king, O king, live forever, or actually standing in the presence of God at the throne in heaven and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. He was a win, it was a win-win situation for him. And it's a win-win for you and I as well. Daniel couldn't lose, and we never lose. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians 1.21, For me to live is Christ, and to die is what? Amen. Gain. Many of you know that. If you're a Christian, you have hope not just for this life, but for the next, which is eternity with God in heaven and all the saints that have gone before. But if you are not a Christian, if you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, ask Him to pay the price for your sins and thank Him for what He did on the cross, this life is the best that you've got. And let me tell you something, friend. Hell is real, hell is hot, and hell is forever. And that's what anyone, the Bible tells us, who does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ is facing. But you're not there because of what somebody else did or because God failed you. You're there because of your sin. Just like me, each and every one of us have broken at least one of the Ten Commandments, either in mind or in deed, let alone the 600 plus that are in the Bible. And so who would be able to stand before a judge and say, well, gee, judge, I, I haven't done a whole lot of bad things. I've only done a few thousand crimes. I think I should be set free. No. We are held accountable for our sin. But that's what Jesus did when he went to the cross. He took our sins for himself, Amen. upon himself, for us, so that all who believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. There's victory, friends. Not only in this life, but in the next. And it's only found in Jesus Christ and His finished work. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for the patience of everyone here. Thank You for all the extra noise that's going to be very exciting over the, the coming hours. But Lord, I just pray in the quietness of our hearts in this moment that we would do some business with You. Lord, we may feel like we're in a pit. We may feel like things are really bad right now. But you are in control. And we ask, Lord, that you would just help us meet our needs and help us to give you the glory and honor. Lord, if there is anyone here who has never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for their salvation, that they would maybe just pray a prayer like this right now. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. People around me know I'm a sinner. But Lord, I believe that Jesus died for my sins, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day to show that my sins were paid for and are no more. Lord, help me now to live for you. Thank you for making, part, making me part of your family, Lord. I want to serve you now like Daniel did. I want to be bold. I want to have integrity. I want to, I want to be devoted to you, Lord, because what you have done for me and help others to see the change that's in me. Lord, I pray this day that people would see the change and the love in us as we're mulling around and looking at cars and talking with people, that people would know that Jesus loves them and how much he has done for them and done for us. We ask this in Jesus' precious name and all God's people say. Amen.